to work. Well, hi, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you, and I'm going to give you an overview of a new guideline that's coming out. Uh, and uh, this morning, say finally in August, because we've been at this for about 10 years uh, as a group, and I'll give you a little more background on that as we go. And here's what the, uh, the uh, guideline will look like a little bit when it ultimately is published. Uh, it's been a multidisciplinary group of about 15 people working for a, a good long time. Uh, and again, we are going eight to 60 days with this because there's a zero to seven day guideline already. And there's another UTI guideline that starts at age uh, or 61 days. So no disclosure is relevant to this. The, uh, the guideline is embargoed until it's published now in August, uh, but I can give you some sneak previews of it and some general principles that will be behind it. It's been a lot of work over the years, uh, again, with infectious disease, general pediatrics, emergency medicine uh, uh, specialists, in pediatrics as well as hospitalists uh, involved with this. And I've actually served as the methodologist, not the infectious disease specialist on this group. And there's still a lot of questions and a lot of things we won't cover, uh, but I'll, I'll certainly be open to Q&A at the end. So at the end of this, uh, hopefully you'll understand some of the risks of various types of bacterial infections in this age group and be able to individualize management approaches for these infants in your clinical practice arena. So one of the big questions with this, is it ever reasonable to send a well-appearing febrile neonate home? And neonate, we're basically talking first month of life. Uh, some people will say 30 days, others will say 28 days is the upper limit of that. And some people say no, that they're all high risk by definition. Some will say yes in select circumstances, as long as the parents and the caregiver are reliable and, and truly informed of any risks, as well as access to uh, care. And some may say yes, usually. So we've been working through this disagreement over the years, if you will. So one of the questions is, how are these babies being managed now? And these studies are a little bit old at this point, but this is the most recent data we have. There was a large study of children's hospitals, 36 at that point, published in 2014, where of all the febrile infant neonates who presented to one of these 36 EDs, 16% or one in six were ultimately sent home and not admitted. And this is contrary to a, a sense in many cases that you probably should admit them all, but we haven't been doing that. And if you look at an earlier study that was done in a number of primary care sites around the country, about 40% of febrile neonates, so if they showed up to their pediatrician's office with a history of fever or active fever, but they looked well, about 40% of them were actually managed at home, whereas 60% were either directly admitted or sent to the emergency department for evaluation. So again, a lot of variability in how we manage these infants. And if you look at this, ultimately the decision-making, so you have either fever, yes or no, and ill-appearing or well-appearing, if you will, uh, yes or no. So if you're ill-appearing, yes, whether you have fever or not, you're gonna do something. So if the baby looks sick, the fever doesn't really matter, although, uh, you're going to pay attention to it, but you're going to do something if the baby's in distress, uh, is lethargic, something like that, even if the fever or temperature is normal. And by the way, you should worry more about hypothermia even than hyperthermia in these babies. So and if the baby has no fever and looks well, one of the questions is, well, why are they there? So we're really talking about the well-appearing infant with fever. How much should you do? And again, this list to the right has all the different types of infections that might be in play. But many of these you can see some evidence of on exam or there's some respiratory symptom going on if there's pneumonia or, or, or you can hear crackles or wheezes in the chest. So the big issues really are bacteremia, urinary tract infection and meningitis. So again, what is well appearing? And that might, that's actually harder to define than you might think. You can also say, is not ill appearing, the same thing. And so what is, what is a runny nose in a three week old who otherwise is feeding well and looks good? Is that well appearing or not ill appearing? Or is that ill appearing? And uh, what if the baby has a little bit of wheezing but is feeding just fine, has normal saturations on room air? Clinical bronchiolitis, very mild, two weeks of age. What do you do with that? No fever or has a little bit of fever, but otherwise seems well. So these are the types of questions that we way in this in terms of 
what risks are we taking if we don't do anything? And then are there harms to what we might do if we do some things? And there's another bit of terminology called, it's called serious bacterial infection. And that's been a traditional measure and that lumps urinary tract infection, uh, bacteremia or sepsis, meningitis, and all these other things together. And the most common of all of these bacterial infections in febrile young infants who appear well is actually UTI. And it's probably more lower tract cystitis than pyelonephritis. But UTI is far more common than bacteremia, which is more common than meningitis. Because uh, of the relative ease of diagnosing the vast majority of cases of urinalysis, of, uh, of uh, UTI with urinalysis, uh, we really kind of prefer to look at the term invasive bacterial infection and certainly sort these things out a bit. And that invasive bacterial infection is mostly bacteremia and mostly meningitis. And certainly the risks that you incur by not treating a UTI for a little bit of time is less than the risk of not treating bacteremia, which is less than the risk of not treating, uh, in a timely manner, treating meningitis. So what are these risks? Well, if you miss a urinary tract infection, you might have some possibility of renal scarring, uh, but we don't really know if that's a lifelong issue for most of these babies. And most, for the most part, renal scarring, when it occurs, tends to occur in children with underlying uh, anomalies of the genital urinary tract. And it's possible a urinary tract infection could see the bloodstream if it's not treated. And then from the bloodstream, you could get meningitis. If you've got a bacteremia, it could go on. A bacteremia meaning basically the baby doesn't look ill, but might have a fever, if I just use that term. But if you look, start to look sick with bacteria in your bloodstream, we call that sepsis. Uh, and so you could go on from bacteremia to sepsis, or you could go on from bacteremia to meningitis if we miss that. So these are risks we're taking. And certainly if there is meningitis and we don't treat it as fast as we can, there is risk of brain damage that's permanent. Now, sometimes treatment early that isn't gonna make a difference. There's gonna be some brain damage anyway, but we know maybe about half of the children will get away without serious effects, but about half will have permanent injury. And you can see the relative risks of these infections in febrile well-appearing infants. Uh, so again, UTI, much more common than bacteremia, which is much more common than uh, meningitis. These are the risks without any lab data, just looking at them, baby looks well, has fever. So in 1993, there was a clinical practice guideline for zero to 36 months of age. And essentially this was a group of about seven experts that got together and argued and argued and argued and came up with a paper. <laughs> and not everybody agreed with this, but this was not a national guideline, but their consensus was admit every baby under 28 days with fever. Even look well or not well, admit them. Uh, and uh, that had been kind of a standard approach. But obviously uh, the first data I showed you, that's not universal. 40% going to a private practice, go home and are observed. And the vast, vast majority of them do well. So uh, the rest of the young infants, first, the second, third month of life, they generally manage as outpatients and uh, did some basic lab work. I'm not gonna go through this um, in, uh, in great detail. Just remember, by the way, if you're looking at white counts again, low is worse than high. We focus on high and high may indicate something's going on, but leukopenia, neutropenia may be worse than leukocytosis or really elevated counts in terms of the outcome of the child. There's lots of reasons you can have a low and it could be viral suppression, but it could be you're on the edge of serious sepsis. So after that came out for 20 plus years, we've been along, you know, there's just been no real national guidance. There've been people that have done research on this. There've been uh, management pathways developed and all the studies that have come out have, uh, there's been some good ones, but lots have had certain flaws. Uh, and we'll go through a couple of these in just a little bit. And we've needed more data on accurate, you know, how accurate is your analysis or your dipstick versus a microscopic? What's the role of these multiplex viral panels? Uh, do they help you? Uh, if it's positive for a virus, does that rule out a bacteria? Actually not. It may lower the risk, but it doesn't get rid of it. And then we've had various vaccines that have reduced some of the infections in the younger age group, certainly Hib and pneumococcus, but those haven't been as common ever in the first month of life. And we're still waiting for group B strep vaccine programs, uh, which may eventually come. It may be a combination of, by the way, of maternal vaccination, maybe the way we prevent neonatal group B strep over time. And then what are the role of inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and procalcitonin? So 
the AAP subcommittee was assembled back in 2007, and we had an AHRQ report that was developed a systematic review, but it didn't separate uh, serious bacterial infection into UTI versus bacteremia, and that skews the risks and how you think about the risks you may be taking. And this worked uh, along for several years, but then stalled out because we could never reach agreement over eight to 28 days. So you have two camps, one admit them all, and one, some of them might be able to go home. No one was ad advocating that they all go home but the idea that sometimes you might reasonably send one of these children home. But finally, there was agreement with some new committee members that came on board and we're gonna have the guideline coming out. Bottom line though, as with many things, we can never get risk to zero. So what is the key issue in this topic? Ultimately, it is risk tolerance. And then the question is whose? Is it the parents, the caregivers? And by the way, what is informed consent and uh, uh, joint decision-making like with a parent of a two week old who's exhausted. And we have enough t uh, difficulty understanding relative risks and risks. Uh, uh, anyway, what is the difference between a one in 100 and a one in 1,000 risk or one in 10,000 risk? Does that even make sense to most of us on a day to day basis? Actually, not. We don't really know quite what that looks like most of the time in practical reality. So I can tell people that, but what does it mean and do they really understand it? What about the physicians? Is it, is it our perspective? How, how, how is, uh, you know, shared decision-making uh, again on this. And then what about hospital systems, risk management? What about payers? Whose perspective matters here? They all do in some way, uh, but these are just the, uh, and who's, who's risk tolerance? And the answer is everyone's. It doesn't matter where you show up first for care, uh, into an office or an emergency department setting. And if the provider you see knows you well, or you know, from one of your older children or not, how can they, do you have a relationship with them? Um, so that, these are many factors that go into this. And then there's a question that we call, you may be familiar with the term number needed to treat, and a variation of that is the number needed to tap, or you know, how many LPs do you have to do on these babies and kids who don't have meningitis to find the one that does? And how many of those are you willing to, unnecessary ones are you willing to do? And when do we cross into harm from doing LPs on babies that don't need them? The answer is we don't really know. <laughs> There are cumulative harms from the things we do, but we don't have them defined even nearly as well as the risk of having missed one of these. So that's just another point to keep in mind. And does the magnitude of fever matter? It may, the higher it is, the greater the risk, even if they're well appearing. 38.5 may be more important than 38. Certainly above that may be more important than that. What about urinalysis? Certainly if it's abnormal, that's gonna tell you to do something. What about CR CRP, CBC, procalcitonins? Uh, again, all of these things go into uh, this uh, equation. Now, what is your risk tolerance? I mean, what risk are you willing to take? Are you willing to uh, miss one in 50? You know, or, or are you willing to uh, take a chance that this baby has a one in 50 chance of meningitis? It means you tap 50, but you wouldn't tap 100. Or are you willing to tap 1,000 to avoid one bad outcome? Now, uh, it might be you're tapping 2,000 to avoid actually one bad outcome because about 50% of them won't have a bad outcome. So where is that? And I have waffled myself somewhere between 333 and 500, but I don't have a scientific basis for that. That's more of an emotional basis, you know, and just weighing things together. Uh, and so there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to this question, but it does impact how you decide what to do. Uh, and then there's, we've talked a little bit about number needed to harm. You tap a child who doesn't have meningitis, but you get a bloody tap. And then you feel compelled to treat them where you might've just observed them. And is there a consequence of lifelong of giving them antibiotics, altering their microbiome? I think we're gonna know that there's not much consequence of a couple of days of antibiotics early in life on microbiome, but I don't know that yet. And so there's gonna be more data on these things over time. So we're always trying to balance what we do and the harms of that, which we may not even understand versus the harms we do understand. And by the way, there was one study years ago that had one of the consequences of admitting children to the hospital who were well appearing was one of the babies was stolen. And fortunately it was quickly recovered, but you know, that things like that can happen. All right, quickly, I'll talk about 29 to 60 day olds and tell you that there's not much difference in how these babies, their risks from in serious invasive in fact, our invasive bacterial infections, so bacteremia meningitis versus 61 to 90. 
And again, these are well appearing infants. And I will tell you that about 90% of babies of any age with bacterial meningitis look ill. They do not look well. And so it's a fairly rare disease and only about a 10% of that fairly rare disease is well appearing when they first show up for care. Nonetheless, uh, we don't wanna miss that, but then that gets back into, well, how many people, how many babies are we working up to avoid missing that? Are there surrogate markers that can help us? Like the, again, the inflammatory markers. So what about eight to 28 day olds? So, the Intermountain Healthcare Process Models, I think is one of the better design studies. Um, they studied over 8,000 infants in 2004 to 2009 and looked at a lot of outcomes like antibiotic duration, length of stay, uh, were they missing children with serious infections? They were including UTI, they lumped UTI all, and, and meningitis and bacteremia all together. And with their pathway, they really, they didn't miss babies that had serious infections and they reduced admission overall cost by 17%. And so, this is their complex algorithm. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, except to say, if you were less than 28 days old, you were gonna get admitted, but you might not always get a full workup and you might not always get antibiotics. Uh, they, and so, but you were gonna be watched. Uh, and, and certainly if you had certain virologic data, they might do a little bit less as well and might decide to send you home. But in their under 28 days of age, uh, they, they were admitting them all and they're admitting some of the older infants based on various findings as well. They're also discharging fairly quick. So a lot of their babies are going home between 24 and 36 hours, not 72 or what we've been using the last few years, more 48 hours. And we know, by the way, that the vast majority of blood cultures that are going to be positive for pathogens are positive within 24 hours, probably about 90, 95%, and the rest are po positive almost always within 36. So if your blood cultures are negative that long, if your CSF culture is negative that long, you've been on therapy or just being observed and you're still well without therapy, it's thought to be pretty safe to go ahead and send those babies home. So that was one of the big positives of this particular approach. I'm gonna skip over the treatment for that. So again, they admitted all less than 28, 28 and under, so less than 29 days of age, but they did observe sometimes and they got these babies out fast. They did take some social factors into account, especially distance to care, certainly for babies that might not have been otherwise admitted. And they routinely did virologic multiplex panels, the same kind of things we use here. Now, the Europeans have been working on this too, and there's something called a step-by-step -step approach. And I'm not gonna give you all the details of this, except to say that they started with uh, uh, a number of, it's a multi-center study with 961,000 babies. And of those, of these babies, uh, less than 90 days old, about one in 36 were in the category of less than 90 days of age with fever. So. Being a young infant with fever is a relatively common reason to go into a pediatric emergency room. And ultimately, they had a study database of 2185 infants. And some of these babies, again, were uh, about 88% of them were well appearing. So they're not all well appearing in this database. And again, the more ill appearing you are, the greater your risk of uh, having a, a, a serious, an invasive bacterial infection. So that skews the data behind this just a little bit. That's why this also is not a full model for use. But in the end, they, they had out of these babies uh, about, they had 87 either bacteremias or uh, meningitis or UTI with bacteremia, et cetera. And they had about 20% with uh, uh, a UTI almost. So again, UTI being much more common uh, as, a, as a bacterial infection. And what they did with this is they used 21 days instead of 28 as a cutoff. So if you were 22 days of age, you might not be high risk unless you had a positive urine dipstick. Uh, and then if you had a negative urine, they did a procalcitonin. And if that was greater than 0.5, they considered you high risk, they would admit you and work you up. But if that was normal, then they'd do a, a C-reactive protein and white blood count on a CBC and look at the white count. And so if you got all the way through that with none of these risk factors, um, you, they called you low risk. But if you look at that, they had still a, a 0.7% risk of either bacteremia. I think they were all bacteremias in this case and not meningitis. And if you think about that, and, and the confidence interval was 0.2% to 1.2%, and 0.7% is one in 143. 
So in this case, you would be uh, evaluating 143 infants to find one. That's not too bad. It's certainly within my acceptable range. I'd be willing to do that to avoid missing a bacteremia that might lead to meningitis. Now this is again, bacteremia, the risk of meningitis is less than this, but you're probably going to find that, that meningitis in the vast majority of uh, uh, times. So step by step, uh, ultimately, if you're less than 21 days of age, they were admitting you. So this really applies to 22 to 90 day olds. And one of the questions is about the fourth week of life, that 22 to 28 days. And this is where a lot of the discussion has, has ranged because this study and some others have sort of suggested that that fourth week may be different from the first three in terms of risk. It may be more like weeks five, six, seven, but it's still not zero. And even in those weeks, the risk isn't zero. Then how much does, again, a procalcitonin CRP or, uh, CRP or white count add uh, alone without, uh, with or without an LP? Uh, so you, again, you get down to one in 143. So this is not a bad approach either. So this intermountain approach and then the step-by-step -step approach are both reasonable uh, ways to go at this, but maybe not the only ways. And one may not actually be better than the other. Quickly about your analysis. Uh, again, how reliable is this in uh, neonates? And what is our gold standard? It's ultimately urine culture. And um, most babies with UTIs have over 100,000 colonies uh, of bacteria per ml of urine. Most places or some places use greater than 50,000 as positive. Some will report greater than 10,000 colonies as positive. So there's a variation in what labs report. And by the way, um, you know, it may be reasonable to do a urinalysis on a rapidly obtained bag specimen, but never a culture. So cultures in these babies should be either obtained by catheterization, bladder tap, which most people aren't comfortable doing anymore, but it's certainly reasonable, needle directly into the bladder over the, the lower abdomen. Uh, ultrasound guidance might help with that, but I've not done one of those in a long, long time. Or if you happen to be a, lucky to have the cup ready and you get a urine stream you can actually catch out of the air, then that might be reasonable too. But ultimately for culture, you need a clean specimen, not a bag specimen. So looking at your analysis, again, data from the Intermountain Group, uh, I'm just gonna cut to this and say that a urine dipstick for presence of, of leukocyte esterase, which indicates there are some white blood cells in the urine generally, or at least inflammation in the kidneys. It's not 100% indicates WBCs in the urine, uh, but certainly in this case, we would, we would take that as evidence. It was 98.7% um, as a negative predictive value. In other words, if you didn't, if it was negative, you had only a 1.3 chance of having a UTI. That's one in 77. So I put these numbers in there to say, it's not perfect. If you go all the way over to urine to looking at microscopic where the urine's looked at under the microscope in addition to the dipstick, you might get a little extra added negative, negative predictive value from the combination above 28 days of age, but not less than 28 days. So the urine dipstick is pretty good, even in an office for looking and ruling out UTI. So that's great if that's negative. If it's positive, you know you're gonna do something. If they're under 28 days of age, you're gonna send them to the ER direct, admit them for at least treatment for a bit, get blood cultures, possibly LP and everything. If it's negative though, you still got work to do. Certainly, you know, certainly under, uh, you know, in, in this age range, are you going, you know, you're, you're gonna look at a CBC probably and some inflammatory markers. Ultimately in the guideline, that's gonna be there. Let's skip over that. Now to inflammatory markers, Traditionally, we've looked at white blood cell counts. So you get your CBC, you look at that, you might look at your absolute neutrophil count, the band count, and in some cases, especially in very young infants, immature to total neutrophil ratio. Uh, we don't typically look at that anymore and certainly not in the eight to 28 days of age. Now the C-reactive protein came along back in the 90s and it actually performs better than the white blood cell count uh, because again, it can be up while your white count's normal or low. Um, but interestingly, then procalcitonin has come out in the last 10 or 12 years or so, and it actually is a bit better than the CRP. Uh, but there are lag times. Uh, and by the way, people have also started looking at what we call biosignature technologies, looking at gene activation types of uh, studies on the blood, what, what types of genes are activated in the white cells, in addition to the CRP and the procalcitonin, trying to find something that's even better than these, where we almost eliminate risk. But nothing's quite gotten there yet that can be done fast enough 
cheap enough to be used clinically. But that might come at least in some of your lifetimes. So again, um, a reasonably well-designed study uh, out of uh, uh, the group in Spain by Gomez and others uh, looked at infants and looked at uh, procalcitonin versus CRP versus white count, again, looking for bacteremia and meningitis. And what these curves mean, the further the line is up to the top left corner of the, of the squares, the better the test performs in terms of accuracy to neg true negatives, true positives. And interestingly with this, the, uh, the procalcitonin had uh, uh, the best of the three parameters here, C-reactive protein, absolute neutrophil count, but all of them together, uh, at least in infants over 21 days of age, all of them together were better, but not in infants under 21 days of age. I will tell you that that's probably not a big deal in less than 21 days of age, because even the guideline is gonna recommend admitting all of those babies probably with a very rare exception. But these are the types of data we have, other studies showing essentially the same thing that the, the procalcitonin performs better on average than uh, the CRP, certainly for bacteria in the bloodstream uh, and, and meningitis. So again, we've talked about within this eight to 28 days of age, which has been our traditional group where many have said admit them all uh, although the European study suggested move that, admit all down to 21 days of age, is the risk of invasive bacterial infection equivalent within all these weeks. So there's some data from really 40 years ago that neutrophil function in young babies, so term infants, it's not up to adult level capacity until about three weeks of life. So it's interesting when you think about that, that uh, we see this 21 day sort of cutoff coming out of the data in Spain. Um, then there are other things to think about, you know, if you're well appearing and you had fever that started 12 hours ago, is that different from your well appearing and the fever just started one or two hours ago? So the longer it's been there and the less sick you look, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, whereas if you just noticed it and you're still well appearing, are you still going to be well appearing in three hours? So factors like that may be important. And there are issues of high versus low grade bacteremia. Uh, so not all bacteria are the same. Some might have a million bacteria in an ML, a, a cc of blood. And some might have one. And we still call it bacteremia, but there's just not nearly as many of them. So keeping that in mind, uh, you know, we don't know that unless we get a blood culture. And you only know that the, the more bacteria there are there, the faster the blood culture typically becomes positive, although that's not a perfect correlation. But the higher grade the bacteremia, the more likely you are to actually get bacteria from the blood into the spinal fluid and cause meningitis. Now, the one meta-analysis that was sort of done for this study, it's not as be published in the guideline, but not in a separate paper, was taking raw data from four different groups and looking at their rate of bacteria, bacteremia by age. And the main thing, if you look at the combined column on the far right, is in eight to 21 days of age, you had about a 4% rate risk of bacteremia. It's about 2.7 or so in 22 to 28 days of age. And in a little bit lower once you get above 29 days of age. And when you put all these studies together, they had similar findings in each. So very consistent across the four. When you put the data together, you get really powerful confidence intervals that actually don't overlap. So we believe we can state that the risk of bacteremia is truly less in 22 to 28 days old than it is in the under 21 days of age, and, but still a bit more than it is when you're older. All right, what do you do with this? Because that risk is not zero, it's just less, okay? <laughs> it's still there. Um, and by the way, just one quick thing on treatment. We haven't really changed this and the guidelines are not gonna change that from some places using AMP and GENT, some now using AMP and cefepime or ceftraxone because cefetaxime is not being made at this point and we're not sure it ever will be again. And then there's still questions about covering for listeria. We see that far less than we used to. Uh, and, and so um, ampicillin will cover that, uh, third, the third generation cephalosporins and cefepime will not, but if you've got an ampicillin, you should be good about that. And, and some people have debated, should we use, again, uh, something like ceftriaxone alone without ampicillin? But right now, we're going to be using two drugs, I think, for the foreseeable future. But just know that there are lots of questions, people asking these questions. So if you're building your own guideline, 
what would you do <laughs> with all this information? So again, if you're not well, you're gonna do something, right? You're gonna admit the child, you're gonna probably treat them, you're gonna do some testing, uh, hopefully get some cultures before antibiotics, but you're gonna treat them and watch them carefully. But if they are well, a lot of them just have viral infections. So I go back to those numbers of UTIs and meningitis and bacteremia altogether, of all the babies that have fever, less than 15% of them, less than one in six, uh, actually have a bacterial infection. So five out of six don't, but, you know, and we've worked to stratify that. So we, you know, you're saying, well, I can eliminate some of that. I can get more data with a urine. Okay, I can catch almost all of the UTIs, but maybe not all of them with a dipstick. And then I can get a CBC maybe, uh, and I'm probably still gonna get a CBC and get a procalcitonin and maybe a CRP or at least one of them. And that's gonna help me stratify a little bit further if all that's negative. And then there's a big debate over, do you do viral testing? Because we do know that if you're RSV positive, your risk of an invasive bacterial infection is less. If you're influenza positive, it's less than if you don't have a viral infection, but it's still not zero. It might be 50% less, but is that enough to change what you do? Probably not. So, you know, do we really need to know that there's a virus or not in our decision-making? And many people answer that as no right now. Uh, although there are some times where it might have value, but that's still, again, up for discussion. So quick sneak preview. Uh, so again, as I mentioned earlier, get a urine, what the guideline is going to say, infants 8 to 21 days of age, you're going to admit them, get a urine, get a blood culture. You can get inflammatory markers, but if you're already going to admit the baby, it's not going to help you with that decision. That's already a decision. But you can still get them if you want to and get Look at the CSF in these babies. So should get a CSF, but occasionally you might not. Uh, but the vast majority of time, we're gonna say still get an LP, blood culture urine LP in these babies and start treatment. Uh, there might be the occasional reason you could say if everything looked normal, maybe you still might not treat, but the general recommendations is still be aggressive under 21 days of age. The risk is enough to go ahead and do your 22 to 28 days of age, you're definitely going to get a urine. You might get the urinalysis by a bag specimen, but not the culture. You're going to get a blood culture and probably ought to go ahead and get inflammatory markers because that may help influence what you do. Uh, might determine if you admit them with treatment or without treatment, or if you decide to observe them closely without admitting them, or if you're going to possibly give them something like an IM or IV dose of ceftriaxone and send them home and follow, have them follow up. So there's lots of options here. And one of the reasons these options are there is we don't actually know the right answers for sure. And so some concept of shared decision-making risk tolerance at the individual level comes back to being in play. There is going to be an algorithm that's gonna look like this. Uh, here's part of it. And you can work your way through this and decide uh, what to do. This is the 22 to 28 day old well appearing. Again, if they're sick, they don't look well, you're gonna do something, the algorithm does not apply. You don't need one <laughs> for that. And remember everything we've looked at is in, in the context of minimizing risk of missing something where there might be a life altering consequence of the infection. But very little that we've talked about talks about well, what are the risks of the things that we are doing? Okay, again, the vast majority of these babies don't have a bacterial infection. Um, so far, I don't know that we have seen much indication of risk from this, but it's never really been studied in 30 year olds who got admitted for real out sepsis uh, when they were three weeks old versus those who had the same symptoms and didn't. You know, those databases, number one, don't exist. Nobody's ever done those studies. So we don't really know if there's a long-term harm or not. As we learn more about the microbiome and the studies that are being done on that, maybe 10 or 15 years from now, we'll have evidence that says there is really no meaningful consequence to treating these babies for a day or two, or there is something, but it's minor, or there is something that's bigger than we thought. We just don't know yet. So that's just food for future thought. But not knowing those things right now doesn't mean that when a baby's sick or when we have some other indication that we don't go ahead and treat because treating when it's really necessary clearly has benefit. And again, may avoid a life altering consequence, especially of meningitis.
So with that, I'm going to stop and see if you have questions. Uh, and I'll see, uh, I may or may not have answers. Okay. Okay. You're at the bottom. Oh. It's when there is one, just don't scroll up. Okay. <laughs> All right, you can type in questions if you have them. Come take a look and make sure I'm not missing something here because somebody might have had something in. No, no one had anything. All right, good, you got it, okay. Well, I, I guess this is really clear then. You know exactly what to do in every circumstance with these babies. Um, and, uh, uh, but this is the type of information that will be coming. Again, I think it's going to allow a fair amount of latitude. And, and the, where it's gonna change practice a bit is in the, um, um, Again, that fourth week of life, there's gonna be a little bit more latitude to potentially send children home. And the other thing, when we have a guideline of this type that comes out, we also have uh, sections in it about future research. So when we've made a recommendation as a group, we've also said, you know, it would really be nice if somebody would do a study about this <laughs> to help us refine this in the future. So these guidelines and the way they're put together become a roadmap for future research that may help this be revised and we'll either know to be more aggressive in some area or that we can be more relaxed. And again, more testing capabilities will come out. Um, I, I do think in five to 10 years, we will have uh, some better things that we'll get, we'll call biosignatures, the terminology now, where you get a small drop of blood, you can look at RNA transcripts or gene activation in that, and hopefully we'll have that capability in the, you know, in a little cartridge in the ED, uh, and you've got it, you can run it in 15 or 20 minutes for 50 bucks. Now, it might be 5,000 uh, bucks when it first comes out, and then you have to weigh, does the cost, you know, uh, does the cost of this, is it worth having that information over current, current tools that are available to us in decision making. Uh, and so we, we're gonna need things that have really higher accuracy, uh, validity than what we have now that are fast and cheap to move us in a way that we can be even more precise in either doing something or doing nothing. And so, and that, that's the case in many areas of medicine. It's not just this, but this is one where we need more information like that. So if you are, young in your careers and you're interested in um, uh, the things that we sort of know and wish we knew better, uh, when you look at a lot of these guidelines, you'll find uh, sections like that and that, that's worth looking at. It also helps you know how well do we really know what we're talking about. Um, and uh, there's lots of questions or things that we have as dogmas that if you go back and look at it, there's very little data behind it. And so sometimes asking questions, do we really know why is it that we believe this? Go back to the original data. Sometimes you don't find a lot there. Uh, it was opinions of a few people 30 or 40 years ago that no one's gone back and done a study that can challenge. So just keep that in mind as you go. And with that, I hope you all have a great weekend. And um, thank you. Thanks so much. We'll take about five minutes so we can get the next presenter's slides pull up and we will start back at 2.45.